Yeah. In an experiment. Yeah, we didn't know you. Why is light so far? Like, it sounds so simple. They had no idea. But now the data speaks. I find this not only refreshing, but, but at some level astounding. Nature. Welcome back to the Nature Podcast. This time, why AIs struggle to learn new tricks and how video games can boost mental health. I'm Benjamin Thompson. And I'm Nick Petrich Howe. As the saying goes, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But perhaps that phrase should be, you can't teach an old AI new tricks. As research has revealed that AI is trained using deep learning, really can't. So deep learning systems with standard algorithms slowly lose the ability to learn. This is Shibanch Dohare, one of the team behind the research. He's got a paper out in Nature this week demonstrating a new way to get around this problem. Now, deep learning is a very common method of building AIs. It's very much inspired by biological brains, as it contains artificial neural networks. These deep learning systems have neurons that are connected to one another. The strength of these connections are known as weights. As an AI is trained on data, these weights get refined as the system learns what is best to emphasise to achieve its given task. This is similar to how your own neurons form stronger synaptic connections when you learn. But while humans have the potential for a lifetime of learning, that's not true for AIs. The algorithms we have for learning, they don't work when you have a stream of data and if that stream changes, the network can forget old things, may not be able to learn new things. All those things happen and the reasons are not fully understood and we don't have algorithms that can just learn new stuff. This means that before release into the world, AIs have their neuronal weights frozen in place. So when new data rolls around, the model can't adapt and learn from it. And so researchers will often just simply toss out the old AI model and train a new one from scratch, using a combination of the old and new data. But with some of the huge models that now exist, like those that power ChatGPT and other chatbots, such a process means gobbling up the whole internet to train a model each time the system is updated. If you ask the old version of ChatGPT, oh, hey, what happened? In 2022, it will tell you, oh, unfortunately, my training only goes up to this date. I don't know uh, what happened after that. So these models become more and more outdated over time. So you ideally want to just keep in learning, keep injecting new knowledge to be with the times, let's just say. The other problem this presents is that unlike you or I, these deep learning AIs would be unable to adapt to real world situations. For example, if AI is used to power robots that are let loose in the real world, they may find themselves struggling with the changing weather, lighting and other conditions that we deal with daily. So to understand why AI struggle to learn over the long term, Shibanch and his colleagues tried out how well typical deep learning algorithms perform when forced to learn continually by testing them on a database of images. There are images labeled cats and there are images labeled dogs. And then you show those to the network and then the network figures out, oh, these ones are cats, these ones are dogs. Once it had learned to tell cats and dogs apart, the system was given a new task and asked to differentiate between two other classes of animal, say a bison and a lion. Once it had figured that out, things started again and it was asked to differentiate between another two classes of animal and so on. And then you will see that slowly, after like 500 such tasks, the network is no longer able to do as well. And if you do it for longer, like 1000 classes, then uh, the network just is no, no longer able to do anything. It's just completely lost the ability to learn anything. Shibanch and the team dubbed this lack of ability to learn loss of plasticity, as unlike a real brain, it's no longer what's known as plastic and unable to be remoulded to learn anything new. 
And why this is isn't entirely clear, but Shibanshi's results were actually released as a preprint a year ago, and so researchers are starting to get a better idea of what's going on. So what we do know is that there are a variety of seemingly somewhat unrelated problems that can come up in a neural network that can cause loss of plasticity. This is Claire Lyle, an AI researcher at Google DeepMind, who's been writing a News and Views article about the new paper. So to give two examples, the first one is this issue that we call dormant neurons, which is basically where a neuron in a neural network becomes kind of insensitive to its inputs, and it outputs the same output no matter what input it receives. The second problem that can come up is where the sort of weights in the neural network grow to be too large or too small. And this can cause instabilities in the optimization algorithms we use to train them. Essentially, it seems that part of the problem is that the neurons themselves have become a bit inflexible and unable to learn. But Shibanch wasn't content to just show that there was a problem. He had also developed a pretty straightforward algorithm to try and solve it, which gets dormant, or less important, AI neurons firing again. You find low utility neurons in the network, the ones that are not contributing, that may be dead, are never active. And then you just reinitialize them and you do it throughout learning. So you make sure that whatever benefits were there in the beginning, they get propagated throughout time. They'll keep injecting plasticity in the network so the network can keep learning new things. By continually resetting this subset of neurons, it essentially randomizes the weights associated with them injecting noise into the system and making them more open to learning new things in the future, making the whole system a bit more plastic, like a living brain. So I think this is a really interesting approach, and it's quite different from what a lot of the literature is focused on. What this paper does is it actually tries to sort of inject noise into the learning process to try to give the network the opportunity to sort of learn new things and sort of overcome potential pathologies that come up in its original weights sort of effectively resetting a small subset of the network. Whilst this problem may not be currently afflicting AIs too much, learning from a fixed data set seems to work okay for most purposes, Claire thinks it's good to get ahead of the problem in order to develop AIs that are a bit more flexible. To better understand what's going on, though, researchers will need to develop better ways to study it. Right now, this is a problem that only really arises for quite complex models that can be expensive to build and experiment on. Shibanch believes that making AIs that can keep learning continually is going to be key for future applications. He thinks this work is the first step towards that and eventually making AIs that are a bit more like animals, ones that can learn new tricks. In a sense, our paper is first step towards continual learning systems that can be adapted and deployed in the real world. So I'm hoping that this changes the field in a way where more people start to work on continual learning, more people start to acknowledge that as good as deep learning is, as successful as it has been, it has some fundamental limitations when we're trying to solve intelligence using deep learning. That was Shibanch Dohare from the University of Alberta in Canada. You also heard from Claire Lyle from Google DeepMind. For more on that story, check out the show notes for some links. Coming up, how video games gave people a boost during the pandemic. Right now, though, it's time for the research highlights with Dan Fox. Freshwater crocodiles in Australia have developed a bad eating habit, consuming poisonous toads. Now, researchers think taste aversion training could help to save the reptiles' lives. In the Australian tropics, many populations of freshwater crocodile have declined by 70% thanks to the predator's ingestion of poisonous cane toads. To tackle this, researchers created bait toads by removing the amphibians' poison glands before injecting them full of nausea-inducing chemicals. They then distributed the now harmless bait in crocodile hotspots, along with pieces of chicken used as controls. Over a five-day period, the team saw that the number of toad baits eaten by crocodiles declined, and found that this new aversion was generalized to live cane toads, with crocodile mortality at one test site reduced by 95% after baiting. 
The authors hope that they can ensure the crocodiles remember their aversion for years to come. Snap up that research in Proceedings of the Royal Society B. DNA analysis suggests that a child who was sacrificed and buried in the 14th century in what is now Mexico was the product of closely related parents. Paquime was a vibrant multicultural centre that flourished between 1200 and 1450. Researchers analysed the remains of a two- to five-year-old child buried in a building in Paquime known as the House of the Well. Damage to the child's skull suggests their death was an intentional sacrifice, and DNA analysis revealed that the child's parents were likely more closely related to each other than first cousins. The authors speculate that the child was from an elite lineage that consolidated power through close relative mating and was sacrificed to consecrate a spiritually important building. You can read that research in full in antiquity. Finally on the show, it's time for the briefing chat, where we discuss a couple of articles that have been highlighted in the Nature Briefing. Nick, you're up first this week. What have you got? Well, when I saw this story come up, I knew it was one that I had to cover. So this is a Nature News story about how video games gave people a bit of a mental health boost during the pandemic. Now, I will say that you and I are video game enthusiasts, aficionados, <laughs> I suppose, and this seems like a good thing, and it proves what I've always known. <laughs> well, in some ways, you're not far off the mark there, because some of the researchers that were interviewed for this article have said, this is really showing what we've known from speaking to video game players for a long time. But the trouble is, such things are really hard to test, because if you want to test someone's mental health... That's quite a difficult thing because normally when you're looking at the effects of video games, you're doing it in a lab setting, mm. which is quite an artificial setting. So when the pandemic rolled around, you may remember that there were lotteries for getting various consoles. So Playstations and Switches right. were famous examples of this. And the researchers behind this new work thought this is a great opportunity for a natural experiment because there are people who are going to be entering these lotteries to get these consoles and then we can see what the effects are for the people who did and the people who didn't get these consoles. So because the supply of the Nintendo Switch was so limited, some people wanted to buy one but couldn't. So they went into one arm of the experiment and lucky folk who did get one went into the other. Right, and then what happened? So basically they recruited 8,192 people in this study in Japan during the pandemic from 2020 to 2022. And they looked at the effects of just owning the console at all in the first place. And it seemed that just having a games console seemed to have a boost to people's mental health. They had higher life satisfaction and lower psychological distress. Interestingly, there were some slight differences between owning a PlayStation 5 and owning a Switch. Owning a PlayStation 5 had bigger benefits among men, people who were more hardcore gamers and households without children. Whereas the Switch seemed to offer a greater boost to family households and people with less experienced gamers. I mean, what's interesting there is it's not that folk are playing a particular type of game necessarily. It's the sheer fact of owning this piece of technology, which is quite an unusual finding. It is very strange, but they did look a bit further than this. They also looked at the effects of actually playing the console as well. And they found that people who actually played the games on either console had increased life satisfaction, and those who played for an extra hour had even further improvements in their mental health. So owning the console and playing it seemed to have some effect. Now, the big caveat here is obviously this was during the pandemic. Mm. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of people's mental health was not at its highest during this period. So this may have more of a boost than it would have done otherwise. So the next steps would be to try and determine whether this effect holds true in other scenarios and other settings. Right. So, yes, I imagine not being able to go outside as well is essentially a big driver of that as well. Exactly. And as you sort of alluded to as well, this hasn't really established what affects different games might have because i don't know about you but i've played some games like dark souls and elder 
Elden Ring, which I'm not quite sure are giving me a mental health boost because they're very frustrating. And then there are other games that are a lot more relaxing and, you know, take you to different worlds and things. So I can imagine that there'll be different effects of different kinds of games. And that's something the researchers want to tackle. Shout out to all those Electroplankton fans out there for something a little bit more chill. But in the words of Mario, let's go to our next story. And it's my story and it's one that I read about in nature and it's based on a paper in science and as is so often the way in the briefing chat this story couldn't be more different and it's about the chicxulub impact 66 million years ago this enormous kind of manhattan sized thing that smashed into the yucatan peninsula and well wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs but a big question has been where did this object come from? Where did it originate? And that's what some researchers have been trying to find out with the help of a rather rare metal. Oh, interesting. How might a rare metal help researchers find out where this asteroid, I guess, formed? Well, it turns out that celestial objects have certain chemical makeups, right? And ruthenium, then, this is a metal, a very rare metal in earth rocks in particular, and it has seven stable isotopes and things from the cosmos have different blends of them and so what the researchers have done in this case is they compared samples of rocks from the time of the impact the chicxulub impact to rocks from eight other impact sites of different ages okay and so they've looked at these ruthenium isotopes and they can distinguish what was going on on. Now, they call it the Chicxulub impactor, right? But the impactor was probably an asteroid, okay? That's what a lot of researchers were suggesting. And also, they thought it was coming from somewhere within the solar system. And what this work has done is added a bit more weight to that. And they've come to the conclusion that likely the impactor originated from the outer solar system, from outside of Jupiter. So they've used this sort of barcode, I guess, to determine that this asteroid has come from outside the range of Jupiter. But does this tell us anything about how it formed? Well, it gives an idea of maybe a timeline of its formation, right? And it all comes back to the cooling of a cloud of molecules that ultimately formed the solar system some 4.5 billion years ago. And this cloud didn't cool in an even way, and ruthenium wasn't evenly distributed among it, right? And so we get some asteroids from the inner solar system and some asteroids from the outer solar system and this work suggests that it is one that formed in the outer solar system and what's neat as well is is one of these kind of ongoing debates in science is was the impactor an asteroid or a comet okay Uh now comets a rock, gas, and ice, whereas asteroids are, you know, essentially just rock. And the researchers here say their data is inconsistent with the impactor being a comet. But that is up for debate. I think there's discussion going on there. And so this data puts forward evidence that it is an asteroid. And so you mentioned there that there'll be sort of debates about this and things. What is left to understand about this impact? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair question. And I think if this work is about where this asteroid formed, where it came from on its hurtling path towards Earth is still up for debate. There's some suggestions that that actually it came from somewhere between Mars and Jupiter, where the main asteroid belt is, because Jupiter actually shifted when the solar system was being formed. So there's kind of this belt between the two. And it may be like a snooker ball, two things knocked into each other, and one of them fired towards Earth. But in general, I think this work gives some ideas of the trials and tribulations of life on Earth and the geological processes going on, because most of the other impacts that the team looked at in this work, so they looked at rocks from other impact sites, it seems that these happened due to something from the inner solar system hitting. But the very oldest rocks, like 3.2 to 3.5 billion years old, looked like the Chicxulub impactor. So it kind of shows what a journey earth has been on you know with multiple things smacking into it from different parts of the solar system well let's hope there's no more impacts in earth's journey for a little bit longer thanks ben and listeners for more on those stories and a link of where you can sign up to the briefing to get more like them check out the show notes for some links and that's all for this week as always you can reach out to us on twitter we're at nature podcast or you can send an email to podcast at nature.com And keep an eye out on your podcast feed later this week for the next episode of Nature Hits the Books, where I chat with Nobel laureate Venki Ramakrishnan about his book, Looking at the Science of Aging. I'm Benjamin Thompson. And I'm Nick Petrichow. Thanks for listening.